Digital forensics is the process of collecting and analyzing digital clues to figure out how an incident happened. You're trying to answer the who, what, where, when, and why as much as you can. In digital forensics, we have four main areas. These are network forensics, mobile forensics, computer forensics, and code analysis. Forensics has its root in the Latin word forensis, which means of or about the court. Historically, forensics was concerned about the discussion and scientific method behind how you collect clues and explain it to the court. So it's all about the judicial setting. It's important that you conduct this process as well as you can, because you never know if the results of your report will end up in court. There are three core principles about forensics. The first is to do no harm. Any of the actions you perform must be done so that they don't affect the integrity of the data. No action that you take while conducting the forensics activity should change that data, which of course may subsequently be relied on in court. The second is to train, train, train those forensic examiners and professionals that are going to be conducting this process. These professionals should have special training to handle the technical and process requirements of the examination. That person or that team must be competent in completing technical tasks and aware of any relevant regulations or policies and also be able to provide evidence explaining why they did what they did and the implications of their decisions. And finally, keep good notes. You've got to document. All activity related to the collection, inspection, storage, transfer of evidence must be preserved for later review. An audit trail or other record of all processes applied to that digital evidence should be maintained. Any outside third party should be able to come in at any time to examine your process and be able to repeat it if necessary. There are four phases of a forensic investigation. The first is seizure. In this phase, you want to ensure that the data isn't tampered with, that the bad guys or good guys can alter the data concerning the incident. Much like a real crime scene, you want to lock it down, prevent any unauthorized parties from entering or messing with what you're working with. The second is acquisitions. And that's the process of extracting data from the scene and try to make sense of it later on. Normally, we take a forensic image of the data. We want to work with a copy at all times because we don't want to risk altering any of that original data and ruining our investigation. The third is analysis. Analysis is the process of trying to make sense of all that data we just collected. This means putting together the puzzle piece by piece, and it can be quite laborious. But fortunately, we have modern tools that can help us make this process much easier and go much faster. And finally, we have reporting. We want to prepare all of our findings in a way that can be presented to any audience. It's important to know your audience. If you know that this is going to end up in court, then there's a certain very high standard that you have to stay with. If it's going to be presented to a technical audience, you should keep that in mind and tailor your report as such. When you know you're about to go onto a scene to start the forensics process, it's important to prepare your jump bag or your forensics kit. This includes hardware, software, and tools that'll help you in the forensics process. These are a sample of tools that I like to have in my jump bag. First, I always travel with a laptop. I like to have lots of memory, lots of RAM, lots of hard drive space, and lots of speed. In addition to making sure that my laptop has the specifications required for forensic analysis, I want to have the forensic software pre-installed. Second, I want to have lots of storage. Nowadays, it's easy to get terabytes and terabytes of storage for not much money, so I always travel with several hard drives. Here I've got a stack of three and a half inch SATA hard drives. Next, I want to have a USB hub. This allows me to connect multiple USB devices and have them appear in my system all at the same time because I only have a limited number of USB spots on my machine. In addition, I want to travel with as many cables and adapters that I can fit in my bag. This includes older ones, such as FireWire 400, FireWire 800, USB A and B, and some newer cables, such as USB C, that's emerging on a lot of machines nowadays. I also want to have some internal cables, such as SATA and its associated power cable. Here we've got a two and a half inch IDE hard drive enclosure. This is useful in case I pull a two and a half inch laptop hard drive out of a system. I can put it into this enclosure and have it appear as an external drive on my forensics machine. 
This is great for making that forensics image that I was talking about earlier for me to perform the analysis on. Sometimes I don't know the physical environment that I'm going to be in, but I want to make sure I have a nice toolkit. This compact one includes screwdriver, various bits, chip extractors, and any of the things I'll need to get into servers or desktop systems. We shouldn't forget about physical evidence. That's why it's critical that you have a camera with you. You can have a traditional camera such as this SLR, or you can use your iPhone because the best camera is the one you have. Also, don't forget about wireless. We can't see it, but it's there. With the proliferation of various access points, cellular devices, and Bluetooth connectivity, it's all around us. It's important to have a spectrum analyzer with you to help you visualize what's happening on the spectrum. We covered a good number of the hardware tools that you should have with you as you enter a scene. But don't forget to have crime scene tape, forensic tape, tamper evident tape, and seals with you. In addition to that, because documentation is so important, you want to have a copy of your IR plan and your chain of custody forms. I'm going to show you an example of some really great resources you can find. Chain of custody forms, IR plan, and contact plans. You can use these to model your own. This is an example of a computer evidence chain of custody form. It has at the very top evidence description to include the type of media. It can be hard drive, USB key, CD, DVD, or other such as floppy. Or perhaps you're using a network connection to download the data. It's important to be as detailed as possible. So we have a space for manufacturer information, model number, and serial number. You also want to provide a content description as fully as you can. Is it just data from a media server? Or is it the operating system and the contents associated with a particular user? Third, you want to describe your collection method. How did you do it? Did you pull the hard drive out and attach it to one of the docs that we described earlier? Or was there another way? Be as thorough as possible in this area. In addition to that, you want to record the date and time that you acquired this data, the name of the collector, full legal name, as well as a signature. There's no way to know whether you might stay with this project or get pulled off for another. So you want to keep good records about history. What was copied? When was it copied? How was it copied? So we can populate the fields here in copy history. Anytime a copy is made from that original copy and any subsequent copies, you want to make sure that it's recorded here in the copy history section. At some point, you will transfer this data. Here is where you can record the time, the date, from whom it was transferred, the signature, and who was receiving this data transfer and the associated signature. So that was an example of a chain of custody form. You also want to make sure that you have your incident response plan, as well as contact list for anyone involved in the incident response process. This is the table of contents of an incident response plan. It include introduction, overview, why this is important. It also shows why this is in line with the overall goals of the particular organization. You want to make sure you have this as a firm reference, just in case there are any questions that come up during the forensics acquisitions or seizure process. As we move down through the table of context, you can see that it includes an organization chart of the CERT, the Computer Incidents Response Team, procedures for sensitive data, because as you remember, depending on the environment that you're in, you might have regulatory requirements if certain types of data are leaked. Also useful is the CERT team member list with contact information and checklists of major steps throughout the process. This is a great resource, and I recommend having this in the forensics process and throughout the incident response process as well. <laughs>